Good morning. Let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. How influential is your mind? Aren't our minds so powerful? Some of our minds are confused or confusing. You know, I, I was planning on being in First Timothy, and the Lord changes things. And how He does it and why He does it, I don't always understand. It's a question I, I have for Him when we're in heaven, if I can sit and talk with Him for a while. But how influential is our minds? They're pretty powerful, aren't they? Okay, you, you can say yes or no. I mean, uh, you know, we don't have to. Let me just give you a, a personal example. You know, my mind is dangerous. I've shared ideas with people and they go, how do you come up with those? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. But the Lord works in crazy ways. This past week, I personally really struggled with my mind. And I'll, I'll tell you why. On Tuesday, I, I finally went to the doctor. I like doctors and I don't like them, but that's my opinion. And the doctor responded to me. He goes, oh, that's a bummer. You have peripheral neuropathy. I said, what the heck is that? I said, I don't know what that means. And I, 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 I don't know, it caused me a, a great battle with my mind. Because I was told things like this. This only happens to those who are over the age of 60. Do you know how old I am? I said, I beat that. I said, I, I'm, I'm only 38, but okay. I, I asked, I said, what, what does the long term look like? Usually, and many can relate, this is just my personal struggle with my own mind. You can tell me years later. But I said, what's the, what's the long-term effects? Like, what's the prognosis? What's the, and uh, they said, oh, oh it's going to get worse and you're going to hurt more. <laughs> I said, and I pay you for this. I pay you to tell me that? What is this all about? And so then my mind just goes crazy. You know, things like, why me? What are you trying to accomplish, God? What's the purpose? H have you ever been there? I mean, let's just give some examples. Miss Lori could be there. <laughs> why me? Really? John could be there this week. Why me? Why did the semi have to turn over? Right? Right? And I think we could go around and, and all talk about it, right? Why, why me? What are you trying to accomplish? And we could all, I mean, I think we could all talk about struggles, right? No? We could just go around and, and listen to individual stories all morning about the struggles we could have with our minds. Our minds are so powerful. They can be such a blessing, and they can be such a, a, a holdback on our life, right? Our minds. Well, fine, God, if you're going to do that, I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. What are you trying to do? Look at, let's start in Mark 8.33. Take your Bibles and turn to, to Mark 8.33. And then we'll jump very quickly to Matthew 22. And then we'll land in Philippians for a while. That's kind of our, our, our path we're going to go. The mind is so powerful. You remember the disciples, right? Jesus had 12 disciples that followed him around and learned from him. And, and listen to what happens in Mark 8, 33. Jesus, in verse 33, but turning around, 
and seeing his disciples, what does he do? He rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. You remember that with Peter, right? You can read the context later. But, but Jesus confronts Peter. He rebukes Peter. And what does he say in reality? Your mind is off track. Get your mind thinking biblically. How about in Matthew 22? You, you remember the, the religious leaders are challenging Jesus over and over and over, trying to catch him in the wrong. And look at what Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 37. A very familiar passage. A passage that I would argue every believer must memorize. It says there, and he, that's Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your what? All your mind. Our minds are so powerful. What I want to do this morning is I want us to seek to understand how you and I as believers can maintain the joy of the Lord. How do we maintain the joy of the Lord in a sin-cursed world, a broken world with bodies that are breaking down, with children that sometimes are rebellious, with a crazy government? How do we have the joy of the Lord? Of the Lord. The question that I would pose for everyone this morning is how do you maintain the joy of the Lord? Well, we've got to start and talk about what is joy? What is joy? Is that the, the smile that we have, or is that the fake smile that mom and dads have on their face when they come into church after they've just been hollering at their kids? Get out of bed, get out of bed, get ready, eat breakfast. Did you really not brush your teeth? You forgot your shoes. Why do you have mismatched socks on, right? And then we get to church, and we're like, good morning. And our kids are like, are you really my dad? Who are you, right? You see, we had the joy this weekend to have the five extra kids with us. John and Jess Cleaver got a little break, and so we got a break too. We took on five more kids. You, could have, you should have seen our house this morning. You should have seen the house this weekend, right? Is that what the joy of the Lord is? We get all the kids at church. <laughs> Good morning, Gary. How are you? And he's like, how are you, Jay? Great. The kids are like, what is wrong with you? Do you remember what just happened to the house, Dad? Right? What is, what is joy? Well, it, it's closely related to gladness and happiness, although joy, look at this, is more a state of being than an emotion. It's a state of being, Right? It's not just slapping a smile on your face. It's not just a, an emotion. It starts with understanding really your core, your state of being, and that is who you are in Christ. It's really a result of a choice, right? Hebrews 12 says what? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Why is the Bible always telling us to, to do things? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Colossians 3, what? Set your mind, where? On things above. You must make an intentional effort to maintain a state of joy. It doesn't just magically happen. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 talks about joy. The, the Old Testament, joy is closely related to victory over one's enemies. In 1 Samuel 18 and Psalm 27, Joy also occurs frequently in the songs of praise, mostly in the Psalms, but we find it in 1 Chronicles 16, find it in Ezekiel 24, Joel 1. In the New Testament, joy is still used for victory, as shown by the disciples returning with joy, even the evil spirits listen to him in Luke.
So we understand that joy is not just a simple, I'm going to slap a smile on and be joyful. It's your state of being. You realize who you are in Christ. You realize what Christ has done for you. And as a result of that, then we are continually renewing our minds. It doesn't just say, oh, I'm going to be joyful and it's done. It is always renewing our minds, which takes an intentional effort. And so let's look at the book of Philippians. I think there's, there's three things that, that I want us to look at in Philippians in order for us to do, in order for us to have this joy. This is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just a couple of highlights I want to touch on. The, the book of Philippians, just so we get some background information, it was written by the Apostle Paul. It is one of the prison epistles. That is essential to remember. He's writing from prison. Okay, um, We could talk maybe over lunch today. What would you write if you were in prison and you were sending it to our church, our church family, right? Um, I, I'll be honest, my letter would be something like this. Hey, I got in trouble for talking about Jesus. These people made a huge mistake. Do whatever you got to do to get me out of here right now. Right? Hey, there's secret ways in this way and that way. Come in and, and, and blow, you know, blow up the, the, the place and get me out. Get me home. But Paul writes and he talks about really life in Christ. This is the evidences of, well, these things will be evident if you know Christ. Number one, I want us to see that if we are going to maintain a biblical joy, first thing is you must understand God's sovereignty. Number one, understand God's sovereignty. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He's writing from prison, and he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will Will, will, I didn't write it down right, sorry, hold on. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That, that's what Paul writes from prison. He has confidence that God is going to orchestrate his perfect plan. He, he wasn't saying, uh, God, I, I think you, you made a mistake. God, how did I end up in, in prison? Well, if you and I are going to have a, a biblical joy, we have to understand that God's plan is perfect. We may not like it in the moment. We may not understand it in the moment, but it's not outside of God's plan. God's plan for John was, was to have this accident this past week. And God is going to use it to accomplish his will in his life. God is going to use Miss Lori's surgery to accomplish his will. God is going to use whatever peripheral neuropathy is in my life to accomplish his will. Whatever that is. I don't know. I don't like it. I was whining and complaining and griping this week like I'm 38. I'm supposed to be running with my kids. I'm supposed to be hiking with my kids. I'm supposed to be able to take them fishing. And we go up on the Mesa last year. You know what I did? I was all wrapped up in braces. And I spent $100 to try to catch a fish. And I lost $100 in lures. It, it, the fishing doesn't work. And all I did, I kept falling and laying on the rocks trying to get myself up and all that kind of stuff. And so he took our kids on Monday. We went to a place in Junction, and we were hiking around. And I was all frustrated. I was all whining and groping and, or, you know, whining and getting mad because I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And guess what one of my kids said to me? He said, Dad, at least you try. At least you try. That's all that matters. Do we do what God wants us to do, right? We may not understand where God's taking us, but we know that God is perfect. His plan cannot be thwarted. Look at Philippians 1 verse 12. Look at what it says. He is in prison. I can't get that out of my mind. He is in prison. And he says, now I, verse 12, I, I want you to know, brethren, 
that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Verse 14. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are pre preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I have appointed for the defense of the gospel. Did, did you get that? Did you get what Paul just said? He goes, ah, don't worry about it. The gospel going forth. Maybe they're doing it for the wrong reason, the wrong motives, the wrong, but they're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. That's what matters. He knew that God's plan was being accomplished. No matter what you're going through, how bad, how frustrating, how discouraging, how upsetting it is, God is in control. Romans chapter 8. You can turn over there for a sec. Keep your hand in Philippians. We're coming right back. Is the Bible true? Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So he said in verse 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Do you believe it? No matter what you're going through, it's going to be good from God's perspective. That's what the Bible says. We'll come back to Romans in a minute. But he says there, it's all going to work out for God's glory. Well, the Apostle Paul understood God is sovereign. He understood that. He knew that God was in control even though he was in prison. You and I, if we're going to have the joy of the Lord, we must know, not just know, but live as if we understand that God is sovereign. Number two, we must understand God's purpose. What is God trying to accomplish? Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Very familiar verse. Paul says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you get that? For to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's writing from jail. But if I am to live on in the flesh. This will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. He says, but I am hard-pressed in both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. But then he says, verse 24, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain on and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Did you get that? Paul says, I've, I've got a dilemma. How many of you want to go see Jesus? <laughs> I do. Count me in. If God said to you right now, if God said, hey, Miss, Miss Laura, you could go to surgery tomorrow, or I'm just going to, I'm going to teleport you to paradise right now. What are you going to choose? <laughs> That's a no-brainer, isn't it? Peace out. Love you guys. I'm going. <laughs> right? That's where I'm going. Paul didn't do that. He goes, I'm in this dilemma. And he said, what does he say? I'm hard-pressed from both directions. And then he says, convinced of this, I'm going to remain on. I don't think when he wrote Philippians, he knew if or when he was going to get out of jail. But he writes and he says, I'm convinced. I'm going to remain and I'm going to continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ. Paul says, I, I, God's not done. God's got a purpose. No matter what you're going through, God has a purpose. 
And if you remember back in Romans verse 29, he, he defines what good is. He says, in, in my words, good is when you become like Jesus. That's good. That's good. Philippians chapter 2. Look at how God was using Paul from prison. 2 1. He says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, he says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, God was not done with the Apostle Paul, and Paul understood God's purpose. God's purpose was for him to continue to pour his life into believers, into the church. You see, if we're going to have the joy of the Lord, we must, one, understand that God is in control. Two, we must understand that God is using us in the midst of the trials. How and why God is going to use me with whatever peripheral neuropathy is, I don't understand it. I personally don't like it. But I say, okay, God, bring it on. Because when we understand what God is doing, we understand that God's way is higher than my ways and his thoughts, my thoughts. And if we understand that God is sovereign over the, the car accidents and our health failing us and whatever else is going on, if we understand that God is in control, we understand that God is going to use us. When does our light shine the brightest for Christ? I believe it's in the midst of trials. I believe it's in the midst of the ugliness of life. Matthew chapter 5 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Your light shines all the brighter. You see, if you understand Romans chapter 8, then you're going to understand 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let me show you that real quick. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he's writing to the church at Corinth, talking to believers. There was divisions within the church. Paul was addressing that. He was correcting their behavior. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says here, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. When we go through trials, the, the frustrating things of life, we have to understand what is God's purpose. Well, first of all, God, all things work together for good to those who love God. Good is when we become like Christ. we got to understand that God is never going to tempt us. He never is going to tempt us. In James chapter 1, verse 1 says he's writing to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. You drop, drop down to um, verse 2. He says, consider it all Joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result. So, so we have got to change our perspective and get a biblical perspective. Okay, all things work together for good. Good is when I become like Christ. God is not the one tempting me. He's going to allow me to go through trials. He's going to let my light shine before men. So our attitudes when we go through this ought not to be, God, why me? It ought to be, God, thank you for counting me worthy to go through whatever trial it is. May I be faithful to you. That ought to be our response. Because if we go further, we could go to, I think it's Psalm, I can't remember, I think it's Psalm 66. And it talks about that, that God refines us talking to believers remember how gold and silver are refined heat heat you know how god's going to refine me you know how god's going to refine you he's going to put that heat underneath you he's going to put those trials of heat beneath you and he's going to put you through the trial and as you start going through that trial then what's going to happen that dross that sin in our lives is going to come to the surface, right? God, why me? 
Jake, just trust me. Trust me with all of your heart. Right? God begins to heat up the, the circumstances. And as he does that, my sin, my dross comes to the surface. Well, Romans 8, what does it say? Good is when what? When Jake becomes like Christ. So that sin comes to the surface. What am I to do? Colossians 3, Ephesians 4, put it off, right? If I'm not trusting God, what is that? It's disobedience. It's sin. So I got to call it what it is and say, Lord, forgive me for not trusting you. Throw off the sin. Throw off the dross. And what? Put on Christ. Lord Jesus, help me to trust you. Help me to set my things Help, my, help me to set my mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. Father, help me to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, who for the joy set before me endured the cross, despising the shame. That's what I got to do, right? Now you can push your name in there. But may we, me, may I, change my focus about this, whatever I have, and go, okay, God, bring it on. Thank you, God. Thank you, Coach, for counting me worthy to be going through this trial. May your name be glorified. May I trust you. No matter what trial it is you're going through, that's where it starts. If you're going to have biblical joy, you must understand the sovereignty of God. You must understand that God is still using you. God used Paul. Look at Philippians 3. These are some of my favorite verses. He says in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Paul says, hey, even though you all missed it the first time, it doesn't bother me, I'll tell you again. And he says in verse 2, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Then he gives us a mini biography of Paul's life. He says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. So what's going on at the church at Philippi? There's these false teachers who've come in and they were teaching a false doctrine and Paul addresses it. He says, look, you guys are trying to convert to the lifestyle of a Jew. And, and forgive me, I can't think of the word. Uh, 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 is it pro proselytizing? What is it? Proselytizing? They're converting over to the, the Jewish lifestyle, saying, you got to live this way. And Paul goes from prison. He goes, look, if you got to live as a Jew. He goes, I've got it. I was born as a Jew. I lived as a Jew. I was a Pharisee. I did all of these things. God's using him from prison. And look at what his conclusion is. Verse 7. <laughs> but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul says, those things don't matter. Christ is above all. He says the Jewish law and the Jewish rules and the Jewish rituals are rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. Well, very quickly, let me touch on thirdly, the results of understanding God's sovereignty and God's purpose that leads us to joy, right? If you don't understand that God is sovereign, if you don't understand that God is still using you, then you will not have joy. You will not have the joy of the Lord. Listen to the use of the word rejoice in the book of Philippians really, really quickly. Just, just hear this out. He's writing from prison. Philippians 1.18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Philippians 2.17, But even if I'm being poured out as the drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. 2.18, You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. 2.28, Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. 
3, 1. We just read this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You guys know that song? Yeah? Okay. Rejoicing is hard. Philippians 4.10, after he just outlined for, for people how to stand firm within the church, he addressed it with, I think it's the Yodi and Sintiki. He, he says, here's how you need to do in order for you to live in harmony and, and to stand firm together. Verse 10, he says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. That's just the word rejoice. Again, he's writing from prison. If you want to, if you have time, because none of us are busy, Go home this afternoon and write a letter as if you were in prison. And then just give it to everybody in the church. And we can make copies at church. Just see what it looks like. Because I'll, sh- I'll tell you what, right now, if I wrote a letter from prison, I don't think it's going to be talking about joy and rejoicing a lot. I wish it did. L- listen to the, uh, how many times the word joy is used. Philippians 1.4, Paul says, Always offering prayer with joy. My every prayer for you all, 125, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy. Philippians 2, 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose. 229, it uses the word joy. Philippians 4, 1, he says, my beloved brother in whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord. We ought to be living out a joyful life all the time, not because our circumstances are easy, but because we understand that Christ died for me. Christ made a way for me to be reconciled to the living God. And then as a child of God, I understand that God is sovereign. I understand that God has a purpose. I may not understand it in the moment, right? When you're going through trials and struggles, isn't it hard to see what God's purpose is in the moment? But maybe you look back five years, ten years later, you go, whoa, God, you used it in amazing ways. And it might be easier to say, thank you, God. But if you want to have the joy of the Lord, friends, you, you have to understand those things. And if you don't, you will never have the joy of the Lord. As I finish this morning, the, the so what question is very simple. Let me read a quote to you. I'm not sure, guys, if I put it on the screen. But it says, Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It is expected of Christians because it is the natural result of having received salvation. The joy comes on account of what Christ has done, irrelevant of what other circumstances are happening in one's life. Here's the so what for you and me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. That's the so what for those who know Christ. And if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ Let me just encourage you. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that God sent His Son to the earth to live a perfect life, to die a horrific death for you and me. And the Bible says in Acts, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I think all of you know me well enough that in no shape, way, or form am I telling you that you have to live a good life or a perfect life in order to be saved. But I will die telling you, if you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, you will make an intentional effort to follow Christ because you love Him. As John 14, 15, John 14, 21, all those passages talk about that. If you don't know Christ, talk to somebody around you. Talk to me. There's salvation in no other name except the name of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You are a good God. Father, I just pray for each one of us here. Lord, I I know that I'm not alone when, when I say that 
It's hard to control our minds. It's hard when we go through troubles and trials and difficulties. It's so easy to to let our minds wander. It's so easy to not have the joy of the Lord. It's so easy to focus, for me, it's so easy to focus on my own circumstances. Lord, I, I know there's probably many in here this morning, maybe who have been there, who has really struggled with, God, what are you trying to accomplish? Lord, I admit I've been frustrated, I've been discouraged, I've been upset because I, I don't like what I was told. Lord, if there's anybody here who's going through the same things, I pray, Father, that you would comfort them. Lord, I pray that they would cast all their cares upon you because you care for them. Lord, help us to be brothers and sisters in Christ who encourage each other to embrace the sovereignty of God, to understand no matter what we're going through, you are, trying, you are accomplishing your perfect will for your glory and for your praise. Father, I pray that we would have a biblical understanding of the purpose of trials. Lord, I pray that each one of us would look to ourselves to figure out where it is that you are refining us. What sinful dross is coming to the surface that we need to scrape off so that we can become conformed to the image of our Savior. Lord, help us to continue to grow in our personal pursuit of holiness. And Father, if there's one here who's maybe professed to know Christ or they've never placed their faith in Christ, may they come to understand that sin separates them from Jesus. But you in your kindness saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but according to your mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that you'd bless your church for your glory and for your praise. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.